A threat intelligence company gets funding, security products in the cloud, incorporating virus total in your security products, two-factor authentication for voice over IP, and more in our stories for the week. Then, John and I will discuss the age-old question, to MSSP or not to MSSP? This is the question. All that and more on Enterprise Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. Brought to you by IT Pro TV, an easy, entertaining approach to online IT training. IT Pro TV offers 1,000 hours of up to date, high quality video training content. Course topics include certified cloud security professional, ethical hacking, cryptography, and VMware. You can stream their courses live or on demand to your mobile device, all for one low monthly subscription price and cancel at any time. Visit itpro.tv forward slash enterprise security to upgrade your brain with the most popular IT certifications. Use the code ES30 for a free seven day trial and save 30% off for life. Welcome, everyone, to Enterprise Security Weekly. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, on the lines via Skype, none other than John Strand from the Black Hills of South Dakota. Welcome. From a nondescript white room in South Dakota, nonetheless. Yes, I'm still waiting for the padding on that the padding. Room. Keep padding. Keep waiting for the padding. I just want to put something <laughs> behind me, yes. like a velociraptor or something. <laughs> something. I went to a dinosaur, dino land, which is part of Edaville, where we went yesterday, and I saw gigantic T Rexes and stuff. It was awesome. T Rexes, T Rexes are awesome. Absolutely. Very cool. um, so we've got a lot of things to talk about. You missed last week's episode, which was a lot of fun with Paul Paget. Make sure you check that out uh, in the feeds from Pony Express. Uh, very cool that Paul was able to come on the show and talk with us. And he talked about the new. He did the new segment with me, John, which was which was awesome. Um, <laughs> we've got an awesome uh, new segment this week. We start off with a threat intelligence provider, Threat Quotient, gets twelve million in their second in their first round. I think it was their was their Series A uh, funding. They they raised twelve million. I think that was based off of uh, a much lesser angel investment, or I might be getting my companies confused. In no, any case, I think, you're, I think you're confused. The first one was a separate ten million raise. This is the second you. round for twelve point five million. I got you. Okay. Um, so I thought it was interesting, John, because we've talked about threat intelligence. Uh, they define what they do as vacuums up data from public, private, and internal sources and analyzes it to help companies react in the aftermath of cyber attacks and to predict future ones. Do you agree? I mean, go ahead. I'll, I'll get well, you. Uh, so, so, so I think that we, in full disclosure, who's the who's the Threat right. Intelligence, it's Threat Connect, threat, right? Uh, threat Connect is a sponsor uh, yep. of Security Weekly, and we've absolutely addressed uh, yeah, this topic we've with them. We've talked about this a yeah. time. Yeah. And I think that they even said that the modern idea of what people think that Threat Intelligence feeds is kind of broken, because Threat Intelligence feeds are basically designed, if they're done properly, to enable a human being, and you and I have talked about this from like an AI perspective with human being, to do yeah. better analysis. So all that aside... What the hell? How many threat intelligence companies do we have now? Um, and I don't know if I was investing, if I would look at investing into yet another threat intelligence company um, as a good financial move down the road. Because I, I think over the over the past few weeks I've been doing the show, almost every single show, there's a threat intelligence feed provider that is getting some more funding and another one that's on the uh, kind of on the cusp. And at Black Hat, there was tons of threat mm. intelligence companies. So how many of these are going to exist in 12 months is the really interesting question after the buzz dies down. And I truly believe that you're going to see some consolidation in this market because when threat intelligence company sells to directly to an organization, I think that's of lesser value than if another security vendor or even non-security vendor integrates that intelligence into their product. And this is something yeah. that we've talked about a lot on the show, and I think it speaks to kind of the way the market's going now. 
Um, some investors felt that this was a viable option. I'm not sure how uh, Threat Quotient is selling uh, their particular services. Um, I also think some differentiators in the market. Um, I mean, anyone can pull public and private sources of threat intelligence, but I think what's going to differentiate the threat intelligence vendors are the internal sources. Who's got the best internal sources is, I hope, is going to emerge as, as some of the winners in this space. Well, and, and that gets into a huge problem, right? It's a scramble for customers. The more customers you have, especially if they're feeding data back into the threat intelligence feeds, the better your threat intelligence is going to be. So if you're a new player in the market, and I'm not saying necessarily that, um, that, uh, that, that Threat Quotient is a new player, but if you're a new player coming into the market, how do you actually keep up, keep up with these threat intelligence feed providers like you know, Threat Connect that already has a really solid customer base? How do you catch up mm-hmm. and actually be effective in the marketplace if you're playing a constant game of catch up with them? Mm-hmm. We got some news from Cloud Passage. Cloud Passage has split up their Halo product. John, are you familiar with Cloud Passage's uh, product line today? Intimately and very completely familiar with Cloud Passage. Okay, so, so uh, Halo Protect, Halo Segment, and Halo Detect are kind of the three products that were broken up. Um, Halo Protect says it reduces the software attack surface of workloads by ensuring proper security configuration, discovering vulnerabilities. Halo Segment uh, does the same thing, reduces the network attack service through traffic discovery, host firewall orchestration, and Halo Detect allows you alerts you if any of your workloads have been compromised by monitoring whether important files have changed. If, but the underlying here thing here is it, it does that in the cloud across your cloud and SaaS providers? Yep. Okay. And, and, and that's probably the coolest thing. Like if, if you're going to try to sum up cloud, like, you know, cloud passage, and you're not trying to look at it from a buzzword de jure perspective. Um, the best way to think about it is with Cloud Passage, you can have a unified, centralized security monitoring platform. Um, and I don't see it breaking down here as for like pa- patch configurations. I think they do have that. It's in Protect, but I don't see it in their breakdown. But imagine having a centralized dashboard where you can manage the security for all of your different systems and multiple different cloud providers. And you have a unified field. You have a unified dashboard. You have unified alerting. Um, it really is fantastic, especially whenever you're talking about cloud-based solutions that may be on Jure and on Amazon or Google, um, Linode, wherever it is. You just install their agent, and then it gives you the ability to actually hook into uh, all of those systems. I don't want to say seamlessly because that sounds too much like marketing hype, mm. but it allows you to hook into those with a common unified theme. That's uh, yeah, I kind of that's how I understood their product to work. But I knew I had a feeling you had worked with them a little more closely and mm-hmm. understood their product line. So. Uh, yeah. yeah, so it sounds like basically more offerings uh, in different packages from Cloud Passage, which which is great. I mean, you know, we've talked about the whole migration into cloud. We'll we'll save those discussions for future episodes, but yep. um, sounds like a good thing. Well, and and you know, on you know, we spent a lot of time ripping on vendors, and I think you and I have had a couple of long conversations about that. And this would be one of those vendors, from our experience and what we've done, and we've worked with them, that I definitely recommend people look into. And if you're an investor, this is definitely a solid company. I think that this is one of those, whenever they talk about green fields and kind of a lot of opportunity to grow, this is an area that I think that they have a really, really strong leg up on the competition. And it, it's just fantastic. So we strongly recommend this product. Yeah. And I, I mean, not to get too philosophical, but um, uh, it, kind of a, a sneak preview into some something I'm, I'm working on. But um, it's I kind of liken it to, uh, you know, we've always said, vendors can come on and, and talk about their stuff and I don't want to make it seem like we're just sitting here and, and poking fun like absolutely send us feedback come on the show you know that kind of thing and I kind of likened it to um, when Kung Fu Masters would meet together for a friendly challenge right and mm-hmm. whoever kind of got the upper hand would never seriously injure the other master um, but if they were to like win they would say oh you know I'm, I'm I'm, I'm very sorry. You must be tired from your journey because maybe they journeyed from another another province in China to to challenge this master. You must be tired from your journey. You know, come back in a couple of days when when you're feeling stronger and we'll have another challenge. And they you know shake hands and greet each other uh, at the end. But what the, the you should take away from that is by 
um, using your skills and looking at someone else's skills, you can figure out what you maybe need to do better or adjust your techniques and your training in certain areas. And I, I like to think that's what we bring here. We may be hard on certain vendors' uh, aspects, but absolutely, you know, we're interested in everyone's opinion on those so that we can go back and develop our own, uh, people listening, develop your own strategies uh, in your own organizations to be more secure. So, yep. Uh, let's see, CrowdStrike has uh, introduced integration into VirusTotal. And they say that the CrowdStrike uh, new approach uh, and additional information source uh, as virus total by integrating the first pure machine learning engine, which is CrowdStrike's product, uh, into virus total. The machine learning engine is, is unique as it also is the first engine in virus total to provide a confidence level as a result of its analysis. So I, I might be missing something on this. Why are they integrating with virus total? So, you know, whenever you talk about, and by the way, like CrowdStrike quite a bit, but so CrowdStrike's claim to fame is that it's a signature-less detection engine, and they're integrating with a signature-based signature -based engine. Interesting, um, now, I also it? know that VirusTotal does URL analysis, and that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty cool as well. But the question I'm getting at is why? Is this trying to bridge a gap? In their tool, it, it kind of um, sounds like, like, said, like it's, it's better for Virus Total. It's what in, yeah, it in reading this right, like because Virus Total is now benefiting from CrowdStrike's machine learning analysis and applying yeah. the ratings to. It doesn't really help CrowdStrike the other way as much if their uh, yeah. machine learning is really good, which people have said it uh, actually is really good. But so, but I'm glad that they're doing it. I, I think that it's 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 a it's a very cool because right now almost everything that's been on Virus Total, like, like it says in the article, is all signature based and it's very boring. Um, mm -hmm. It's almost as though when, with CrowdStrike being integrated into Virus Total, it's almost like you have some sandboxing and analysis capability now into Virus Total as well. So, I like I like you said, I think it's great for Virus Total, maybe less awesome for CrowdStrike, but basically what this is going to show, just to be completely blunt is this is going to show a lot of people that are doing analysis on executables that, that CrowdStrike's model and also Silence as well um, flat out kick the living snot out of any traditional signature-based detection engine that's out there today. Well, and I think the, the real win is the combination of the technology. You've got the machine learning, you've got a human element, and you've got some signature-based mm -hmm. detection. And as yep. we've said before, you know, combining all three of those is really what we're seeing emerge as some of the winning strategies in these different battles that we face in computer security today. Now, there was one thing in this article that kind of bothered me, um, and this is something that's been eating me for a while, and I think I mentioned it in previous uh, previous shows, is uh, it talked about how CrowdStrike got a 100%, what was it, 100% detection and zero, here we go. So here's the sentence. It's the third paragraph. It says, CrowdStrike's machine learning engine recently achieved a perfect 100% efficiency score, 0% false positive score on an independent antivirus certification by SE Labs. So one of the big, big questions that I have with a lot of these products that are coming out is are these products good or are they just good at detecting what penetration testers do? And that's something that I think we, it would be very, very cool if we could have a shootout of the people associated with Security Weekly, that'd be like Black Hills Information Security, um, and Guardians, of course, invite trusted sec. And actually get some really good firms that we all trust um, and and have us go at these different products and see how they actually work well, in a real-world scenario. Think, I don't think their aim is uh, to make a product that detects penetration testers. In fact, I think you might find it's more difficult than you think. However, I think in some of these tests, like, what are they testing? Like, are they taking really known and uh, well-known malware? And that's what's in the yep. lab, so you can detect it 100% of the time? I mean, unless they disclose exactly how the tests were being run, to me, the results are kind of useless. And I haven't looked into this particular study, but just from history, that's kind of what I find people doing um, in, in a lot of these tests is if you take yeah. things that are known and you can detect 100% of them, and that's that's not cool. Yeah, and uh, this is, I don't know, we, we've had a number of these A-B tests that have been done in the past, and they're usually complete crap. And I don't know much about the uh, fine folks at uh, avcomparatives.org. But uh, they, you know, I, I, I think that there needs to be anytime, anytime, anytime you read anything that says that it detected 100 percent in this particular situation, it detected 100 percent of 355 yeah, live test cases. 
that's pretty but much the, shows a to lot me of that it, sucks. it from a technical perspective it's not so much detecting the malware a lot of them it's detecting how it's encoded or detecting mm-hmm. its behavior both of which can be changed easily, yeah, easily by anyone easily. so yeah that's my so concern. I honestly feel like a really good analysis would be an analysis where the security researchers should, if you're given enough time with any product, they should be able to find a way to bypass certain security products. Mm-hmm. Anytime you see anything that's 100%, it almost reads like a dictatorship. It's like, and Saddam Hussein wins with 100% of the vote. Yes, no exactly. One, no one trusts that. No. And that's something that concerns me. And I'm not doing this as a rip on, on CrowdStrike or Silence or any of those guys because they we tested them. Their products are very solid. But I also know that it's not 100% effective. Um, and any time I read that, it, it screams something is very, very wrong Absolutely. here. And I think that we need some better independent research on this. Interesting integration. Mobile Iron derived credentials will integrate with Entrust Identity Guard Mobile Smart Credential, a.k.a. derived credentials, uh, to provide government agencies that want to use mobile technologies uh, the ability want to use mobile technologies... That doesn't make any sense. I quoted it right no, from the article too. I you know you're reading it exactly as it is. Okay. Let, let me I try it. it. Maybe me. it sounds better. Maybe it sounds better in my voice. Mobile I- Mobile Iron derived credentials with Entrust Identity Guard Mobile Smart Credential derived credentials will provide government agencies that want to use mobile technologies the ability to protect sensitive data while eliminating the need for passwords and hardware tokens. <gasps> you all right, breathe. <sighs> <laughs> breathe, breathe. Yeah, it actually, it did, it did make sense, but just not in spoken aloud English. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Um, uh, but then it still doesn't. I don't know. Oh, anyway, okay. I'm still trying well, to figure out what this actually means, John. What are de- I, uh, I should know what derived credentials are, apparently. Maybe if we Google it, maybe there's a Wikipedia article on derived credentials. Derived this, this credentials. Is, is that is this I'm the first year? Tra- is this like a trademark? thing? It's got to be a. Th- there's, there's people screaming at us that it's a thing. Oh, it's a NIST thing. I'm sure yeah. that people are freaking out. Yeah, derived so derived credentials refer to cryptographic and credentials. And we have a NIST document that are derived from personal identity verification or smart cards, essentially, right? Because that's what DoD is using as smart cards still. It looks like it's being used in conjunct, like kind of synonymous with digital credentials. Um, yeah, smart card access for mobile derived credentials. Okay, so it's centrified. Yeah, centrified does something with it too. It just looks like it's. It's a smart thing. card thing. I don't know. I don't see smart cards other than what in the government this? right now. No. Well, no. Okay. So, sm- uh, all right. So, smart cards, as near as I can tell, the places where we've actually tested them, um, your little CAC cards and smart cards have never yeah. stopped an attacker and they never will. Um, because a lot of times, the uh, it'll help protect the actual workstation itself, right? But if you're plugged in and you have your CAC card or your derived credential card, and it's actually plugged into your computer system, and you're on a domain, you've been granted a token, and I can still compromise your account and use right. that token as it is active. So I don't know. I, I, let's, let's just pivot this and say that multi-factor authentication is a good thing. Yeah, um, no, Especially I, if it's something like Google Authenticator or a countdown pin. Like I agree, an and it's a great result. segue into our next uh, article about Okta. Um, which is interesting. Okta is a very interesting company. Uh, I, I think it has a pretty good adoption rate. Uh, I've personally used it. I think it's a good product. I don't know. Some people may disagree with me um, because there is kind of an annoyance factor there. But I think you know the whole security and convenience trade-off is uh, different for different people. Um, but they've integrated with Ring Central. Ring Central is a cloud-based VoIP provider. So basically, you can use your Okta two-factor or single sign-on uh, authentication mechanism uh, to, uh, well, Okta's kind of, they're more of a single sign-on kind of thing, right? But you can couple that with two-factor authentication. So in order for me to get into the Okta uh, credential manager thing, I have to give my username and password and then maybe my Google auth- authenticator code or some other kind of two-factor authentication. I think they did, didn't we say they did a, an integration with Duo or something? I think they do yeah, integrate with well, Duo. It, so, you know, in, in this whole this whole entire thing, I think it's good. The more you start seeing these single sign-on providers, multi-factor authentication actually being integrated more and more into workflows and workforces and organizations, we think it's awesome. That's great. But I had something interesting. You know, we were talking about provisioning, and you, you know that my my take on provisioning is pretty, pretty blunt. I don't like it. Um, whenever you're provisioning of administrative level access, whether you're provisioning Ring Central or you're provisioning access to a Linux server or a Windows server or whatever, I don't like it. 
mainly because a lot of times when we test those organizations, they don't really get in the way of attackers so much as they make life difficult for systems administrators. Right. I should clarify, and, Ring Central is more of a cloud PBX rather than a VoIP yes. provider. So yeah, yeah. yeah. There you go. That, that's probably a better way of putting it. So one of the things that one of our listeners shot me in an email is he said that one of the biggest problems they've had in their organization of actually implementing provisioning of access to servers is it actually gets in the way of DevOps. It actually gets in the way mm -hmm. of doing operations and getting things done. And if something goes down and you need a systems administrator to get on it right away, but you need another higher level systems administrator to grant that access for a short period of time, as soon as it gets in the way of ops, as soon as it gets in the way of actually production, um, those particular tools get ripped out fairly quickly. And I thought that that was interesting. I'd like to hear more people's mm. takes on it because my take is pretty much I break it and attack it. That's what we do at BHIS. But I never really thought of the DevOps angle as far as it becoming cumbersome for day-to-day -day operations. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that because you've done DevOps and you've done security and you've done pen testing. So what do you think, Paul? Well, no, I, th I think you're right. I think any kind of... Um identity management or single sign-on or two-factor can definitely throw a monkey wrench in the works when it comes to you know troubleshooting or getting people access quickly i think it does add a layer of management and i think the companies that are going to emerge in these spaces are the ones that make it easy for you to do that however when you use the word easy it tends to be less secure so i think there's kind of this uh the needle goes in both in both directions as we go through and hopefully we find a happy medium um, but I think it's, uh, you know, kind of interesting to look at, um, security measures, so-called security measures that make it easy. And I think, you know, single sign on, uh, and to a certain extent, two factor try to be very user friendly. And, and as, yeah. as you gave in your example, John, you know, does that really make it more secure? I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 there have been some situations, some products out there that actually do make it difficult whenever it's implemented, but it always seems to be on a smaller to medium sized organization. Yeah. yeah. And as soon as you to provision getting... tens and tens and thousands of users, yep. They have yeah, to make it easier, that. which makes it less secure, basically, is what I experience. Okay. So, speaking of horribly, unbelievably confusing things, what the hell <laughs> is with this company getting a patent for a VPN? Sky High, <laughs> that's pretty much what they did, right? Let me see. There's a <laughs> sentence that um, allows... It is a, oh, so, the pat, so Sky High Networks gets a patent. The patent uh, also discusses the process by which customer-controlled master keys are used to create derived keys that are in turn distributed to proxies where they are used for encryption and decryption process but never stored. Uh, what? And they're saying this is new. I'm like... Okay, sounds I, now. Um, but wait a minute! But that's also that's also the way a, a VPN works, right? Like I have my key, and you have a key. And the VPN is kind of like a proxy for that, and never stores the key theoretically, right? Yeah. Oh, or, yeah. Or that's just like the same thing. <laughs> it's like not <laughs> different. Um, so I don't understand. You know, the person that says, "Yeah, in this case, there's no prior art." Um, and to be honest, any kindergartner would say that just because, you know, I don't know what the hell this is, it's no prior art. Just because you haven't seen it doesn't necessarily mean that it hasn't been talked about in every crypto book now, it, since but Schneier. Our, um, you know, so. our security experts, uh, some of which we know, like Dave Lewis uh, from Alchemy, points out there's no shortage of prior art and is actually surprised that they got a patent. There's nothing new here. Uh, 451 Dave, Research. Dave is quoted in this article? Dave Lewis. Oh, there he is. Yes. Okay, that's awesome. Sweet. And uh, Garrett Becker from 451 Research uh, yep. says they're not the only ones looking to separate keys from encryption. CypherCloud and Vaultive have been doing this for a good five or six years. <laughs> and I like how the article immediately drops down and says, this is Vaultive and this yes. is CypherCloud. And here's other offerings. Yeah. Um, it's pretty horrible whenever you try to do a press release about a patent and immediately the people at Network World start talking about your competitors that have been doing it longer than you have. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the, the patent office is far from perfect. Uh, I, you know, the, there's a lot of issues there. Uh, patent trolling is certainly a thing. And uh, it's not an easy problem to solve. Uh, I think multiple yeah. administrations have, have looked at, uh, at least I know the Obama administration has been pressured to look at this problem. Uh, but I think we're, we're far away from fixing it in any large capacity. Yeah, and I don't, think, I don't think the Obama administration or any of the other upcoming administrations are going to get into it. I mean, 
if you look at, you know, just getting into politics a little bit, nah, I don't want to go, but anyway, no, let's not. Um, there's a very cozy relationship to many organizations in Silicon Valley and not just the White House, but members of Congress that uh, really have a good, good financial incentive for keeping the patent level wars that are going, going. And uh, I don't think that it's going to change. It's not a partisan thing of Democrats or Republicans. It's pretty much all of them don't see a lot of incentives to change the status quo. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't get political and pick a side, but I got all conspiracy theory. That's awesome. I liked it. I liked it. Um, Research and markets news. Global deception technology market uh, from 2016 to 2020 is estimated at a $1 billion market. And in this article, they talk about Grody Core, which is someone we haven't covered because I can't say their name. But we've talked about Ativo Network, Symmetria, and TrapX on the show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which they say are the key vendors uh, in this space of deception technologies. Now, John, you and I have been doing offensive countermeasures uh, in concept for quite some time. It just happens that's the name of our company. But in concept, we've mm-hmm. talked about deception technologies. What's your take on the vendors in this space? Um, so if I had to go through the ones that I like, of course, Symmetria would be at the absolute top of that list. The ability of take, creating an entire kind of rat's nest. But in full disclosure, we, we love Gadi Evron. Um, he's, he's just awesome. And uh, they have a free version. You can basically pull down Symmetria and you can run it for free. And that's huge. You know, that's basically putting your product on the line and saying, we trust it. Right. You know, if you like our product enough, you're going to try it out. And here's technology that proves that we know what we're doing. Um, at, at TVO, I would say, would be second, followed closely by Trap X, and then oh, Rowdy. Gaudi, yeah, Gaudi, I've, never, oh, I've not heard Gaudi. of this one yet. Hey, maybe if we go to their website, they'll say how they how you pronounce their product. No, maybe they'll say what they do. That's awesome. <laughs> Apparently, asking way too it much. looks like the uh, it looks like the key vendors they misspelt it. It's uh, <laughs> it's guard i guard core guard core guard core guard i core guard core guard core. At least I can kind of pronounce that. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. Oh they man, did, they, they spelled have a it monkey. Wrong. They have a really fantastic. They actually there's have a PR person at Guard at Gardacore that is like losing his sh- or his or her respective shit right now. <laughs> Justifiably so, yes. by the way. Uh, yes, I and mean, you have every I, right to. We got your back on this one. They should spell your company name right. <laughs> all right, so Gardacore, whatever the hell, Gardacore, Gardacore, Gardacore has a tool called the Infection Monkey. Um, and the Infection Monkey is a free cybersecurity testing tool that assesses the resiliency of modern data centers against attack. It's a self-propagating and is able to identify and visualize the path of least resistance to the data center network. Oh, my God. Yeah, um, but you know, so many you times... you see the picture but, of this thing, dude. But this so many times, awesome. John, I've, I've looked at a vendor and I'm like, wow, if, like, if that actually works, that's really cool. And no, they sometimes, give it away for free. Sometimes... Well, yeah, yeah, see, there you go. Um, but, and sometimes it, they make it work. And I think most oftentimes maybe it doesn't work quite the, the way I would have hoped. But... You know, I've shared my Palo Alto story many times. Oh, like, yeah. That's yeah. really cool if it'll work when they were a small startup company and now they're like one of the largest security companies in the yeah. world. So <laughs> obviously, they made, they made some stuff work, okay? <laughs> yes, yes. But dude, you've got to go see the infection monkey. I don't, I don't even know what the hell Gardicore does. They just have this infection monkey thing. And but, I like, I like the con- I, but I like the concept, though, of the infection monkey. I, I do, monkey. too. Yeah. The infection monkey looks like it's a self-propagating malware that you just release on your network to see how vulnerable your network is to malware that self-propagates. That's um, that's cool hopefully. with me though. Like I said, if they can make that work and it doesn't oh, yeah, break yeah. stuff, I, I think oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. God, no. Oh, and and Gardicor, Gardi, Gard, Gardicor, Gardicor, Gardicor. Um, we need to get you on the show if Absolutely. anything we f- i feel bad one. that they spelled their name wrong in the press it's release horrible. i'm glad I, we spent um, some time talking about them because it makes up for that god <laughs> so we need to get them on the show to try to make up for that and then they need to talk about their infection monkey would you right? like to touch my infection monkey <laughs> he's staring at you he's not happy uh, john infection. we're gonna do something a little different here on the show we're actually gonna take a short break uh and come back and then John and I, in our uh, topic segment this week, are going to talk about to MSSP or not to MSSP. That is the question coming up next. 